He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is our third study in the Gospel of John. And last week we considered John the Baptist, a different John, uh, the great gospel preacher, this wild man dressed in most peculiar clothing in the wilderness, crying out, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was a gospel preacher and the great need of the hour are not diplomats, not politicians, not great generals, not great economists, not great scientists that will give the vaccine to cure all ills, but the great need of the hour is for gospel preachers, for those who will preach the gospel of Christ in an undulterated way, and to preach it the full and free offer of the gospel to all who would come. We need to hear the word repent. Repent from sin. There are too few churches in our nation that are preaching, you must repent. And if you refuse to repent, you will perish. These are the words, not just of John the Baptist, but of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. There needs to be repentance from sin. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. I don't know how long we've got in this world. I don't know how long you've got in this world. But we're all going to face our last breath. And we must all, all stand before God at the end of our day. And if we have not repented, and if we have not secured Christ as our Saviour, we will perish in our sin for all eternity in what the Bible calls hell. And it is an everlasting punishment. As I say, I do not know how long this world has. John said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Of course, he's speaking of Christ. But we would say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand because Christ is coming a second time and will bring this world to an end. And as I say, we don't know how long this world has. It might end in our generation. President Putin has his finger hovering over the button and he's mad enough and evil enough to press that button. And nuclear weapons will fire over the globe and obliterate life as we know it. I'm not sure whether that will happen. I know that there is a sovereign God and nothing happens without his will. It's not the will of a man in Russia, in the Kremlin. It's the will of God. But he must alarm you. He must awaken you that time is short. We don't know how much time this world has. But we know that without any repentance, there is judgment. The second thing that we saw in John the Baptist is he preached not only repentance, but faith in Christ. And that's what you also need. It's not just enough to be sorry for your sin and to turn from them. But it's to trust in Christ, to wash you from the guilt of your sin and to reconcile you to God. You must behold, you must look upon and consider and embrace the one who is entitled the Lamb of God, the Saviour of the world. Well, in a moment we're going to come to the response to this preaching. 
And in verse 11, we will see that there are some who refuse Christ. There may be some in this congregation, those who are listening in online, that will refuse to repent and say, no, I will have my sin. I will have this world. I will take my chance. And refuse to repent. And there will be those who accept him. Verses 12 to 13. Those who believed on him. Those who received him. It's not just believing about historical character. It's trusting him and embracing him as your personal saviour. So let's look at the text. And it's most interesting in verse 10 as we begin. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Christ appears on the earth, in the world that he had made. In chapter 3 and verse 13 we are told that he came down from heaven. No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man. Now, do you know anyone in this world who has ever been a historical figure in this world that has come down from heaven? There is not a single person other than Christ. We started our existence at conception. And we became not only that genetic information that is in every cell of your body at this present time, but you became an individual, a unique individual at conception. But Christ came down from heaven. We have seen his pre-existence in this early part of this chapter. That he was with God and he was God and he made everything. And it says here, he was in the world and the world was made through him. Here it is, a man appearing on earth, the creator of the stars and of the universe and of mankind with his immortal soul. Here he is, the son of God, the son of man, as he prefers to call himself. He's always been the son of God. Before time and space began, he was the Son of God. But he became the Son of Man. He took upon himself the nature of our human being and became wonderfully, mysteriously joined together as the God-man. Fully God and fully man in the same person. We can't understand it in full. But it's what the Bible teaches and we accept it by faith. He came down from heaven. God willing, next week we'll get on to verse 14, which is one of my favourite verses in the book of John, which reads, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What a great text. The Word who made this world became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived for 33 years in this world. He was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in Nazareth. He preached in Capernaum and in Jerusalem. And he was arrested and he was crucified. And he rose again. This is the saviour that we proclaim who dwelt among us. He dwelt among his disciples in his resurrected body. Alive from the dead. This is the saviour that we proclaim to you. And so in verse 10, we have this mysterious, intriguing verse. He was in the world. The world was made through him. And, listen to this, the world did not know him. The creation did not know the creator. Isn't that mysterious? Isn't that intriguing? How can this be? Well, I've got a couple of potential answers which I would put to you. First of all, I would say this, that his glory was concealed. His glory was concealed. If you were to look at Jesus, if there was a group of Jewish men 
that had grown up in Nazareth, and there was to be a lineup, and you were to say, which of these is the Son of God? You wouldn't be able to know. You, he wouldn't have a halo above him. He would just look ordinary and quite plain. There is no beauty or majesty, Isaiah tells us in the chapter 53 of his uh, book. No majesty about him would attract us to him. And uh, he was just ordinary. Um, no halo. To his brothers, <laughs> Jesus had half-brothers. Mary and Joseph went on to have children of their own. And uh, brothers and sisters. To his brothers, who would have grown up with Jesus, playing football perhaps, I don't know. Um, well, he's just Jesus. He's our brother. <laughs> he's not the son of God. Uh, there was a time they didn't believe in him. Though we're glad to say, if you read through your Bible, that some of his brothers did come to believe on the Lord Jesus. And perhaps one of them even became the first pastor of the church at Jerusalem. The name was James. Interesting. But um, to his brothers, when we have it here... He didn't, they didn't recognise him as the creator. Yes, Jesus is pretty good with a plane and a chisel and a screwdriver and other instruments that a carpenter would use. The thought that he created the world, he designed DNA, he made the stars, he created matter and energy and time was beyond their comprehension. Because his glory was concealed he was perfect as a man, but he was always God. He concealed his glory. He didn't reveal it. He didn't sort of at some moment of weakness, of course we're speaking of the Saviour, say to his brothers, do you know I'm actually the Son of God and I created this world? And he proved it to them by creating something or opening their minds to understand. No, he didn't do any of those things. He kept it under wraps. So he came, he was in the world, and the world did not know him because his glory was concealed. But secondly, and I think here is another reason I would put to you that the creation didn't know their creator and they didn't recognise Jesus as the Son of God is because when it speaks of the world here, it speaks of mankind in a fallen state. Man in his blindness. Man in his spiritual ignorance did not know him. And you know, that is still the case today with many. And it may be that you're an unconverted person and you see nothing special about Jesus. Well, he's a historical character. He's that preacher from Nazareth, isn't he, that, that was written of by Josephus and Tacitus and other historians. Uh, the carpenter from Nazareth, the, the preacher, the, the uh, whatever you might want to call him. Gandhi, who was a man of unbelief and died in his sin, thought that Jesus was one of the best of men. But he was God. He couldn't understand him. And, you know, this world, in their blindness, do not see Christ. They don't see their need of Christ. They don't see their sin. They don't see eternity. They are spiritually blind and spiritually dead. And so we talk about a world of fallen man. We described in the first week that the world is in darkness Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There it is. The same truth that is spoken of here about the creation. We cannot comprehend spiritual realities. We cannot see the invisible. You can have a radio telescope that can see billions of miles into space and pick up the, these little galaxies. And something I'm particularly interested in is quasars. And you can see this pair of quasars being ejected out of an active galaxy. We can see that. We can see with the tunnelling microscope right down to the structure of gold atoms. We can almost see with electron microscopy the atom itself. 
but no equipment that man can devise can see that which is invisible the invisible God and so we see the darkness of man the ignorance of man they did not know him they did not recognize him and they did not welcome him and this is what this text is saying when it says it did not know him it did not have any affection for him it did not receive him as we will see later on in verse 11 that he came to his own his own received him not it's speaking of the world light has come into this world but you see darkness opposes the light it doesn't like the light you see these you see a great big stone and you lift it up and you get some friends to help and you lever it up and there are tiny little insects scurrying out of the light trying to bury themselves back in the soil into the darkness they hate the light well this is what we read in John chapter 3 and verse 19 this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil you know why, why most people don't believe in Jesus Christ is because if he is who he claims to be the son of God and the saviour of the world then we have to give up our sin and we love our sin and we don't like to be told that we are sinners we don't like to be told that we are hell deserving sinners which is what the Bible teaches we resist it we hate that kind of thinking who are you to judge me I'm not judging you it's the Bible this is God's Word declaring to you that you love your sin and you can't love the Savior of sin who will deliver you from sin and love your sin it's like the the drug addict he loves his drug it gives him an effect he's addicted to it he's under its power he doesn't want to be saved from his addiction he wants to go back to it and um, again this is the the case it exposes what is false and shallow no wonder the religious leaders of the day in which Jesus lived became his most violent opponents the Pharisees the scribes the doctors of the law the rabbis of the synagogue they would not have Christ because he exposed their hypocrisy do you see hypocrisy in the life of religious leaders you know we heard I, I read a report of a, a bishop he was a bishop in Argentina that had been interfering sexually with priests the Pope Pope Francis as he likes to call himself who also comes from Argentina defended the bishop and uh, he even had him transported from Argentina to Rome to run the accounts of the Vatican well this bishop has recently faced the court of law for the sexual malpractice that he has done and he's been sentenced to something like 10 years now you see there it is uh, the one defending paedophiles and all sorts of things uh, that which is hypocritical we say it's horrible how can it go in fact this paedophilia is rife through the Roman Catholic Church it's been said uh, uh, there's a figure of 6% of Roman Catholic priests are paedophiles and interfere with countless numbers of children abusing their spiritual influence over others to gratify their sinful nature we don't stand with any of that and we're not just talking about what's Catholic it could be Protestant it can be uh, any dead church any dead religious leader spiritually dead I mean we hate hypocrisy we do not associate ourselves with such things we want to keep to the Word of God and to keep our heart and mind pure 
and to obey God faithfully. And uh, we don't do it perfectly, but we are sincere, I hope. That's the Christian. He is a sincere person. But you see, the religious leaders of the day, they loved the accolades. They loved people bowing down to them. They loved the kissing of the ring, as it were, the recognition. They prayed and they said, oh, if only I could pray like a Pharisee. There he is on the street corner, praying about himself. I thank you, but I'm not like other men and I don't do this, that and the other. These were the great opponents of Jesus Christ because he said, as John the Baptist said, he said, you vipers, you hypocrites, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Jesus said, you're like a rotting corpse in a coffin. Outside, people see the mahogany and the brass and the beauty of the coffin or the whitewashed tomb, but inside, full of rottenness. Now, you see, when you expose sin in those, people don't like it. And they stood violently opposed, and I say violently opposed, they plotted his death. We'll come on a little bit more as to how they did that as we see the Jews rejecting Christ. So let's move on to verse 11 because the world did not know him because of their sin and their love of sin. But here's verse 11. He came to his own. He came to his own people, the Jews. They had been waiting for more than a thousand years for the Messiah. It was spoken of in the Garden of Eden. It was spoken of to Abraham, who looked forward to the Messiah and put his trust in the Saviour to come and was justified by faith in Christ. But here it is. David, the great writing prophets, all looking forward to the time when Messiah would come. God would send Messiah. And he's come. And how did the Jews receive him? They were unimpressed. They said, what? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Look at him. He's no king. He's no Messiah. He's just ordinary. He's like you and me. They thought, you see, they had a wrong idea of what Messiah would be. They thought that the Messiah would be like some historical character in the past. Someone like Alexander the Great, who was about the same age of Jesus when he conquered all the known world and brought all under Macedonia, this great conqueror. They thought he'd be like him. He would, they would be saved from the Romans. And they would be a prosperous nation and rise above. They were thinking of material prosperity and accolades and, and honour. And everyone would look up to them when Messiah comes. They had a very wrong view. Because if they read their Bibles, they would see that the Messiah was to suffer. And by his stripes we are healed. But he was despised and rejected by men. That's the Messiah, the suffering servant. So they wanted to be saved from the Romans, but he came to save from sin. Call him Jesus. The word from heaven came. Because he will save his people from their sin. Great crowds heard Jesus. Many of them had hoped in seeing a miracle. Ah, oh, there's nothing but a Jew likes more than to see miraculous signs. There was one time that he was in a place called Capernaum, which is up in Galilee. And um, it's thought that maybe the house was the house of Peter. I don't know that. It doesn't say it in the, in the word. But this house in Capernaum, there were so many that came that they crammed into this house that it was literally packed in like sardines. You couldn't get another body in there. 
They'd all come to see Jesus. And there were people outside looking in the windows. They thought, they hoped that they might see some miracle. There were also among them some of these great opponents, the doctors of the law. And they were wanting to find some fault in what Jesus said and declare him a fraud. There was a man who was paralysed. And his friends carried him on a stretcher. And they could not get into the house. And being men of faith, they didn't give up. They looked up to God in prayer. And as they looked up, they saw a flat roof and a staircase going up the side. And an idea came to their mind. They would go up to the top of the roof and start digging through. And this is what they proceeded to do. And then they made a hole large enough and lowered this man right down in front of Jesus. At his feet. You could have heard a pin drop. What was Jesus going to say? He looked at the man. His need was obvious. But there was a more obvious need to Jesus that he had. He said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Wow, that really drew a mutter. The doctors of the law, only God can forgive sin. And they were, they were true, that was right. Only God can forgive sin. And so Jesus said that you might know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. He looked at the man and said, get up and walk. And the man who had been paralysed all his life sprung to his feet, picked up his bed and walked out. And everyone was amazed. Everyone but his enemies who started to plot his death. There was a man, and I could tell you another man, Matt, we know his name. He was called Lazarus. And he died. And he'd been put in a tomb. It was a warm country. He'd been in the tomb by Jesus' time, the time that Jesus arrived, he'd been in the tomb for four days. And Jesus moved with compassion, said, roll away the stone. There was objections, they said, but there will be a stench. But they obeyed. And he said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And there appearing in the doorway was a man in grave clothes, like bandages. <laughs> and he said, let him free. Wonderful miracle. People they were just astounded, a great crowd, but there were also these religious people and they saw at that time to kill Jesus. They plotted. They found one of his disciples that was willing to betray him and uh, that was it. They rejected him. He came to his own and his own received him not. Do you see the opposition? They had him arrested. And when Pilate said, Behold the man, and there was Jesus with his cr crown of thorns embedded into his head. And he'd been scourged. And he said, Away with this man. We have no king but Caesar. And the, it was the religious leaders, they persuaded others, reject him, crucify him. And, and that's what happened. They had, when they arrested him, they had no law that per permitted them to put the man to death. They had to go to the Romans, so they asked Caesar. And when Caesar said, when they said crucify him, shall, we, shall I crucify your king, he said? We have no king but Caesar. This is a Jew speaking to Pilate. We have no king but Caesar. We want him dead. They rejected him. So this isn't merely apathetic rejection. He came to his own and his own received him not. This is a wholesale, wholehearted rejection of Christ. And even when he was on the cross, there were a crowd that gathered to mock and jeer. If you are the son of God, they said, come down and we believe on you. 
Jesus had to pray that God would forgive those who crucified him. You know, but the question really that I need to ask isn't really about the Jews some 2,000 years ago, is it? It's about you tonight. Do you reject Christ? Do you receive him not? Do you keep your distance? Do you push him away and say, don't get too close? I'm not so bad. You know, it's not just, there are two ways, it says, two ways not to receive something. There's to openly reject it. And there is to neglect it as well. You might not be one who openly rejects Jesus Christ. You're here in a, in a house of God tonight. I don't think that's the case with anyone here, to be honest. But it's quite possible that you've neglected to come with all your sin and fall upon your knees and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus, be my personal saviour and save me from my sin. That's the question is, do you neglect him? He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But verse 12, thankfully there's a verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believed on his name. Here we now we look at the believing response. As many. As many. Let me just think on that word for a moment. Jesus is sufficient. For every person in this congregation. And every person listening on online. And every person who will hear this message. Throughout every Bible believing gospel preaching church. Throughout this world, as this message is proclaimed, anyone who comes to Christ can and will be saved. As many, as many as received. And there's no case like, we were thinking this morning of Noah's Ark. (laughs) It made me think, there was sufficient for all the animals, and then there was a lot more space. All of those that Moses, uh, sorry, Noah, could have reached to, And saying, come into the ark and be saved from the flood, could have been saved. But you know, the illustration breaks down in one sense, because there is only a limit to the number of people that could have fitted on the ark. And then it would have been full. And can you imagine that there was a great response, and everyone wanted to be saved. And Noah said, I'm sorry, we can't take any more, we're full. Shut the doors. It wasn't actually what happened. God closed the door and there was only eight saved. What a tragedy. Many perished who could have been saved. As many, sufficient for all. Now these are very similar words, aren't they? Let's just try to separate them out. As many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Two words, very sounding very similar. Receive and believe. Two things we need to do. To receive. um, Well, let's take the believe, first of all. (laughs) It's clearly more than just believing certain facts about Jesus, isn't it? It's lovely to have a Sunday school. We tell children about the Bible stories. But it's not just enough to believe them to to be true. They heard today about Daniel being cast into a den of lions. What a great event that took place in Babylon. It's not enough for those children to say, I believe it happened. Or I believe that Jesus died on the cross. Or I believe he rose from the dead. It's not the orthodoxy of your faith that saves you. It's what your faith is in. It's whether you are trusting in Christ. Not that you believe he's the son of God. Not that you believe he's the greatest man who ever lived. But it's do you believe on him? Do you trust him? And that's what the word believe means. It's not an academic assent. It's a personal, heartfelt trust that Jesus and him alone must save me. But to receive is the other word. It's to embrace. 
You know, I used to say to our young people when I was a youth club leader so many years ago now, when you take hold of Christ, you make sure you use both hands. Both hands. Don't have a hand on this world and say, I'm going to keep this back. And I'm going to still have this world and Christ. I'll still have some of my precious darling sins and have Christ. No, you, you take hold of him with both hands. With both hands, like the drowning man. And the life ring is thrown to him. He says, take hold. You don't just casually take hold of it, do you? You both hands, you put it on around you and hold fast. That's how you must take hold of Christ. Take hold of him. You come, you've come to see these things. I am a sinner. By nature and by practice. And I need a saviour. And Jesus is the saviour that I need. And I'm going to take hold of him. Have you done that? To those who receive him, to those who believe on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Here it is. What happens? Here's the question to close with. What happens if I trust in Christ? You're given the right to be called a child of God. Isn't that wonderful? To be called a child of God. There are two ways you can go into a family. And both apply when it comes to salvation. You're adopted. And someone comes to that orphanage. And they look at your file and they look at you in action. And they say, I set my love upon this person. I want them to be in my family. And I adopt them. That's what God's done for us. You set his love upon us. But you can also be born directly into a family. And that second point is central in the Gospel of John. You must, you must, you must be born again. Not of blood. You're not born a Christian. Just because your parents are Christians doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you've been brought up on your mother's knee and she has read the Bible and prayed to you and your father has prayed for you and exhorted you and you've been brought to church does not make you a Christian. You must have a first-hand faith, not a second-hand faith. Not born of blood, not of the will of the flesh. It's not a decision. I'm not an evangelist that says, if you want to believe, come to the front and your decision will save you. No, not the will of the flesh. It's not an emotional response. It's not the will of man. You're coerced into it. You're coerced. But you're born of God. God works in the heart. You're born again of the Spirit. And God becomes your heavenly father well these are the things that happen to you and uh, we'll go on no doubt to discover more about what it means to be a believer but as a child of God you're cared for you're provided for you're dearly loved you've got a heavenly home where your heavenly father is to those who believe on his name have you believed on him have you embraced him with both hands May God help us in these matters for his sake. Amen.